In this presentation, we'll be discussing surface plasmons. Broadly, we will discuss what they are, under what conditions they exist, the dispersion of surface plasmons, and how they interact with plane waves. A very basic definition of a surface plasmon is an electromagnetic wave, but a surface plasmon is different from other waves in that the only place in which they can propagate is directly along a surface, such as the boundary between air and a metal. So if we draw a surface here, and we say that air is on one side, while metal is on the other, each with their own relative permittivities, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, the surface plasmon can be visualized as propagating like this. Since surface plasmons are a specific type of EM wave, we can examine their electric and magnetic fields to find out where they exist. We'll make a boundary here similar to the previous section in which we'll define x as here, z in this direction, with again the relative permittivities of air and of metal. Our surface plasmon will propagate in this direction. So first we'll examine the transverse electric case. In this case, where z is greater than zero, or in air, our electric field will be comprised of the magnitude of the field in the y direction because of our transverse assumption, with the wave propagating in the x direction and oscillating in time. And then finally, the wave will decrease in amplitude as it increases in length from the x-axis. Similarly, when z is less than zero, we'll have our second electric field in much the same way. The main difference is that it will also decay as a function of its distance from the x-axis. In this case, alpha one and alpha two are greater than zero. From here we can examine the magnetic field values by taking the curl of E, which we know equals negative permeability times partial H partial T. Assuming that our waves are time and space harmonic, we can replace our derivative by T with negative I omega, giving us the curl of E equal to mu naught I omega H. Since we have the transverse electric case, we'll know there's two components of the H field. And knowing the curl equation, we can say that those components are HX and h of z. So now we can write the full magnetic equation for air. Which has two components, as you see. And is simply multiplied by the original electric field. and the magnetic equation for the metal. As we know, at the boundary, or where z equals zero, h parallel should be continuous. As we can see, the x direction is the one parallel to the boundary. And as we can see from those alpha one and alpha two values, this is not the case. Therefore, surface plasmons cannot exist in the transverse electric case. We'll now examine the transverse magnetic case and see if they work there. 
This is going to be very similar to the last case, but with magnetic fields instead of electric fields. This time we'll take the curl of H, which is equal to epsilon dE by dt, using the same assumption of time and space harmonic waves as before, we can find that the curl of h is equal to negative i omega epsilon e. From here we can find ex and ez. Using those equations, we can again examine them for air and metal. Now if we examine h parallel at z equals 0, let's go back a slide, we can see that when these terms go to 0, we will have h1 equals h2. Which is as expected for the boundary condition. We also need e to be parallel at the boundary in the case of transverse magnetic. Looking at the above equations, we can see that that is only true if negative alpha 1 over epsilon 1 is equal to alpha 2 over epsilon 2. Therefore, we can see that negative alpha 1 over alpha 2 must necessarily be equal to epsilon 1 over epsilon 2. Since from learning dispersion we know that epsilon can in fact be negative, this looks like it'll work. We can have a plane wave if epsilon 1 or epsilon 2 is less than 0. As you can see from the above equations, the divergence of d, which is a scale factor of e, cannot be equal to 0. This implies that there must be some form of charge at the surface from the integral version of Maxwell's equations. This also means that surface plasmon is not a transverse wave. The fact that we have charge at the surface shown on the previous slide implies that we have a dispersion relation for surface plasmons. From Maxwell's equations we have one more condition that must be met. This is that alpha squared minus kx squared is equal to omega squared over c squared times epsilon r mu r. For our two cases, one on either side of the boundary, this becomes We can combine these equations producing the following. And since we know that epsilon 1 over epsilon 2 must equal negative alpha 1 over alpha 2, from the previous section. We can rearrange the previous equation to find which can be simplified
This is the dispersion relation for a surface plasmon. Note that if epsilon 1 were to equal negative epsilon 2, kx would approach infinity, while the wavelength lambda would approach 0. Now that we know some basics about what surface plasmons are and how they move, we'll examine how to interact with them using plane waves. So we'll take the same setup as before, with the boundary in the xy plane, and the z-axis here. We'll have our surface plasmon propagating along the boundary. And now we'll have the general form of a plane wave. propagating obliquely towards the boundary. This plane wave has an angle theta with the z-axis. As a reminder, the dielectric is on this side of the boundary and the metal is on this side. Now the plane wave will have, as we know, k equal to omega over c. Since it's traveling in a dielectric, it will be modified by the refractive index or the root of the relative permittivity of the dielectric. Examining only the x component of this plane wave to match with that of the surface plasmon, we can modify this term again by just a sine theta term. The surface plasmon has kx equal omega over c times the root of the dielectric permittivity times the metal permittivity over the sum. The surface plasmon and the plane wave may be able to interact if these terms are equivalent. Following this equation through, we'll see some cancellation right away. resulting in this equation. As we know, sine theta must be less than 1, or greater than negative 1. And this term on the right must be greater than 1, as the epsilon of the dielectric is positive. As such, this configuration won't work to excite a surface plasmon. The Kretschmann configuration is a setup involving a prism bordered by an extremely thin piece of metal. This is the same as the previous configuration, except that we were trying to excite a surface plasmon here. We'll call it sp1. In this configuration, a surface plasmon is actually more likely to be excited here, at the outer edge of the metal. So we'll draw the setup again, with the plane wave entering at some angle theta. Mechanically, the difference between this configuration and the previous one is that while surface plasmon 1 is exactly the same, surface plasmon 2 borders the air instead of the dielectric. We can better see the difference if we once again go through the equations. So k for a plane wave for excitation must equal k for the surface plasmon. Now in this case, again, same as last time, the plane wave has this equation. And the surface plasmon has this equation. This is a new EA term to represent the relative permittivity of air, which we know equals 1. Let's fill in EA and compare again. Once again, we can cancel these terms. And by bringing the root ED over to the right side,
This is significant because, for example, glass has a relative permittivity close to 4. And some metals have a relative permittivity in the range of negative 8. As you can see, that definitely brings the right side of the equation into range of negative 1 to 1, which sine theta must be. So in short, using the Kretschmann configuration, it is possible to excite a surface plasmon on the outside of the thin metal strip. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for watching.